Good evening, good evening, and welcome to our Revelation Bible study. We hope all is well with you and your household, that you're staying safe uh, from being around town a little bit. Obviously, no one is staying home, uh, but we are glad you are safe. We're trusting God, believing that we'll be back together soon, uh, sometime towards the end of this week, when we see what all the insurance companies and all say, we'll know where we're at with the church, and we will give you a full live update uh, as soon as we possibly can, but we don't want to tell you something that's inaccurate. We would be more like the news, LOL. Just kidding. Uh, let's worship together for just a moment. Let's just take a few minutes and worship together.
Hey, all right. Enjoy worshiping with you. Always enjoy our time of worship and always easier and smoother to get into the word when we worship. Last week, we talked to you about who is Christ? Who is Christ to you? Uh, my computer's sliding a little bit. I'm just going to let it slide down. Uh, who is Christ to you? And so this week, we got some folks that um, we wanted to share what who Christ was to them. And so we're going to take just a few minutes and let them share their testimonies, if you will, of who Christ is to them. Uh, so we will be hearing from Miss Carlene, Miss Jenny, and Miss Annette. So uh, join with me as we get those testimonies. I was asked to come here this evening <clears throat> and speak of what I believe God means to me. I tried to come up with one word, but I couldn't because God means everything to me. Uh, he's my friend. Uh, when I have people I think are my friends that desert me, might make fun of me, say bad things about me, he doesn't. He comes and puts his arms around me. He provides for me. God has made a way for me since I lost my husband, and he's blessed me with income faster than I should have gotten it. His income I should not have reached and got it until 30 days from the day that he passed away until the day I received it was exactly 12 days. God provided for me. He's never left me without, and he's never left me short. I still have enough to last all month long. He's my teacher. He teaches me where to look for things, like when I was uh, looking for her first fruit, I didn't know where to go. He said, look at my word, and I did. And it said, your first fruit you give to your priest. Well, my priest is my pastor. So I said, okay, Lord, you want me to give it to the pastor? And I got showered. So I knew that's what God wanted me to do. And so I was following every lead that he gave me. And he spoke to me and he told me if I do what he told me to, he's told me to watch what he would do. And God has richly blessed me ever since I've done that. Um, he's a healer. Uh, I have problems with arthritis in my hips. and hurting really bad and I laid my hands on my hips and I come against that arthritis to leave in the name of Jesus and uh, the pain to relieve and not come back. The pain quit. I went to sleep with no time of having to wake up in the middle of the night with my leg hurting or my hips hurting really bad, running up to the back of my back. He's got so much love for me that I couldn't find the love I wanted on earth. But with God, it's a holy love. And it's a love that never leaves you. It stays with you. He puts it around you. He just like, I had these big white wings that just came wrapped up around me. And everybody was afraid, you know, of the virus. Well, I wasn't afraid because God told me to have faith and to believe and to trust in him. So that's what I do. I take him at his word. When he tells me he's going to do something for me, he's going to do it. I have no doubt in my mind. I don't doubt it a second minute. And if God tells me and speaks to me and tells me to go do something, I do it. Wherever he leads me, that's what I do. And the thing I thought about on the Lord was when he crucified himself, got hung up on that cross that day for our sins so we could be saved and have a second chance in life. It says in the Bible there's no greater love than a man that will give up his life for someone else. And that's what Jesus did for us. We couldn't ask for any greater love than that. And for that reason, that's how I feel about my Savior. He has never left me, he's never forsaken me, and he's never left me destitute. And I will praise him to the days of my life. Hi, I'm Jenny and I would like to share my story with you today. When Pastor Mark asked us last week who Christ was, I started answering that question in my own private journal. When Pastor Wendy asked me to talk to you, I panicked, I cried, I prayed, I began writing. Jesus sent a friend who called me. That's how Jesus works. He puts people in your life at just the right time. Thank you, Sterling. I began writing again. I talked to another friend. I wrote some more. I text and I talked and I kept writing. 
Thank you, Annette. See, I grew up in Sweet Home. Some of my oldest friends are going on almost 50 years. No one person has ever heard this whole story. Those of you who know me know bits and pieces of my story. Some of you will find this unbelievable, but that's okay, I understand. I grew up in an era where a child was seen and not heard. I'm not comfortable talking about myself, but I will do my best. The subject is worth sharing, for sure. I just have not considered myself worthy to be used by God. Here is the story of my Lord and Savior. I hope and pray one day he can be yours too, if he's not already. I don't ever remember not going to church or not knowing Jesus. He was my friend, my healer, my comforter. When I was four, I was diagnosed with a heart condition that was going to require surgery. I was very sick. I spent two years in and out of the hospital. There was a series of books with children's Bible stories in it. In every doctor's office, hospital waiting room we visited. Jesus looked the same in every Bible story. So my friend of many years now had a face. Jesus with tall, was tall with light brown hair and a beard. The sun shone through his hair and it made it almost glow. He wore a white robe with a red sash and sandals. Jesus' presence drew you into him. I was never afraid. By age six, I saw him as a real person and he made his presence known to me. I thought that everyone could see him. When it was time for my surgery, my friend Jesus was always present in my heart and in my room, at home or in the hospital. After surgery, I wanted to go live with Jesus. I could not understand why I couldn't go. Wilma and Orville, sweet family friends of ours, explained that it was not my time for me to go live with Jesus. Wilma went on further to explain that beautiful baby girls belonged here with their family. So my heart healed and my relationship with my God grew every day. I was baptized at age 13. My heart was on fire for God, but way too shy to witness, although I was very active with my church. At age 18, something terrible happened that changed everything. I still had my faith, but I was broken. I lived in fear and shame. By age 20, I married a non-Christian man. He cheated on me and left several times. We were young and had different priorities. By age 23, I had two boys and was a single mom. I never turned my back on my God but I took my life into my own hands, or so I thought. I went to church off and on, prayed here and there, and made lots of poor choices. I worked full time and raised my boys. My boys were in all the activities you could imagine. Life was chaos. I would pick up a second job when I was not going to school. Sometimes I did both. The most important things in my life were Michael and Matthew and making our future bright. Please remember Jesus was my friend and he was always present in our lives. I was single, poor, and raising two boys, but we had our needs met and we had love. One of the things that was always helped me in my life was music. There are so many songs I could have picked to describe my life during those times, but the one that's on my heart today is The God Who Stays by Matthew West. You are the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away. And you tell me nothing I've ever done can separate my heart from the God who stays. That is what I mean when I say he was always present in our life. I knew he was my God, but I also was well aware of the fact that I was broken and using him as my crutch and not worshiping him properly. I was not interested in dating. I was too busy raising my boys and planning my future. By then, some of my hard work had paid off. 
and God had blessed me in my career. We were finally on our way, in my mind, still not spiritually right with God, but he was still blessing me. After, after 15 years, I met a man at work. He did not send his paperwork into the finance department where I worked, and I was forced to reach out to him. It seemed like fate or something. We actually started dating and two years later married. I really thought this was the man that God had sent to me and my children. He was stable, hardworking, gentle, generous, and kind. Six years later, things started falling apart. We lost all communication. I turned to counseling and church. He turned to work and another woman. I gave up going to church and only spoke to God privately, but not properly worshiping. Four years later, the marriage ended. That was four years ago. Since then, I've been on a journey to find out who Jenny really is. The first thing I did was return to church. It gave me hope and made me happy on Sunday, but the happiness didn't last, and I was not growing in my relationship with Christ. I was very sad with no hope for the future. I was convinced that life had passed me by, and it was. I worked and hid from the world the rest of the time. It was easy. No one missed me. I was convinced that I was not worthy of love and did not deserve respect. I had been invited to Harvest Christian Center many times by my beautiful friend of more than 40 years, Annette. I spent all of my preteen and teen years there and thought about it, but I always had a reason not to go, still attending the other church off and on. Undeterred, she kept praying for me. I decided one day to surprise her and to come to Sunday service. That was seven months ago. One Sunday during worship, I felt the Holy Spirit. He told me I was home. This is where you belong. This is where you were baptized. The faces are different, but I am the same, and this is where I want you. Since then, Sterling and I have, have become really good friends, and he's a wonderful mentor. I have met so many kind and wonderful people. Thank you, Pastor Wendy, for wiping my tears and mentoring me. There are so many wonderful, beautiful people here. I won't mention names because I didn't get their permission. Let me just say thank you and I love you all. I am so much happier and I can't stop saying thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. So who is Christ to me? He is my friend, my healer, my comforter, my savior. So if you are lost and alone, and feel like you don't belong. I would encourage you to find my friend, Jesus. Thank you. Hi, I'm Annette Allen, and most of you know me because my parents go to church here too. I've been raised in church. I was baptized at 11 with my dad, and I've served the Lord most of my life. Um, I, Jesus means to me, he's my provider, he provides a way when sometimes there's not. So I'm just really thankful to have the Lord in my life and have people in my life that support and help when you need it. And I'm I'm thankful that he provided me with a voice so I can sing because I'm on the worship team and when I don't when I'm not on the worship team I feel empty and so I was really excited to join the worship team a year and a half ago took some big steps and I think I'm where I'm supposed to be and that's really it thank you 
Isn't it amazing to hear what God has done in their lives and, and who Christ is to them? Uh, I'm excited because I, I know what he is to me or who he is to me, and I love to hear who he is to others. Uh, that he did not come to destroy me, but he came to save me. Uh, if, if that's you, you can give him a hand clap right there in your living room right now. Uh, just absolutely excited about who Christ is. Last week, we talked Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. We're going to go back to Revelation 6 tonight, and we'll be going into, um, we'll be breaking it down a little bit. Uh, and as we get into that, uh, we'll just go with it as we can. Uh, let me um, uh, let me go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, and then we'll take just a second break so that we can, and then get right back into it. So, Father, we thank you today for who you are. Thank you for your Word, sixty six glorious books of who you are. God, I love you today, and I praise you. I thank you for your Son Jesus, for your sweet Holy Ghost, and that you're still in control. I pray that you minister to us and through us tonight in your precious and holy name. Let us receive from your word. Amen. Chapter six of Revelation. Chapter six of Revelation, beginning with verse one. Uh, we read verse one and two last week, but we want to go over verse one again. Uh, and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, this is the, the lamb of God, the lamb that was slain before time, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We know this to be Jesus. And I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. I love it because each and every time he tells us, come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. Uh, just constantly reiterating that we need to be looking at what we see. Uh, and John verse two says, and I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, come and see. That's verse three. Uh, so going back to those two verses, uh, a lot of us have been taught over the years that the white horse was Christ. Uh, a couple of notes I'll throw in here. I do not believe that. I believe it's the Antichrist. It's an image of. Uh, one of the reasons I believe that is simply right there in the scripture. Although I've done a lot of research beyond the scenes, but in the scripture it says, and a crown was given unto him. And as we read down through more of this, we will see what that simply means. But it means that he was given authority to go out and to conquer and to be conquering. And I do not believe that Christ needs authority. He finished it on Calvary. And when he rose from the grave, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He does not need authority given to him in the form of a crown or anything else. So reality is, I believe this is a antichrist sent forth into the earth with the other three horses. Let's go ahead and read verses four through eight. And then uh, very briefly tonight, we'll be very brief. It's been a very long week and uh, I apologize, but we'll be brief tonight. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that set their own to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Many, many of the translations say a fiery red, a fiery red. That word actually translates out to be more of a uh, fiery red. Let me read that to you real quick. Let me pull that up. Uh, just uh, having the color of fire or red. So it's translated out fiery red, if you will. Um, and it was power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, verse five, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when they had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with the hunger 
and with death and with the beast of the earth. So here we see we have a white horse coming with three other horses. Uh, most of us have heard of the horses of the apocalypse, right? Uh, most of us have definitely heard of the horses, horses, horses of the apocalypse. My cameraman is laughing at me. Uh, you've heard, you've seen movies, videos. Uh, if you're a little bit younger, maybe you've seen memes, um, you name it, memos, uh, YouTube, uh, it's everywhere. In fact, not only have you heard of the four horsemen, but let me let me give you a, a fact here that is not in scripture, but it is in Google, okay? Uh, when you Google the four horses of the apocalypse, the four horses of the apocalypse, it will pop up on your screen and say that between articles, videos, and everything else on planet Earth out there, there are four million... 520,000 articles or videos about the four horses of the apocalypse. Now, we just read eight verses, right? Really more like seven verses. And yet there's 4,520,000 articles or videos written. Do you know what that means to me? There's 4,520,000 opinions on what this means. So what we will be doing is different than opinions. Now, let me say this. If you've already got your mind made up on what it means, nothing I'm going to say or do is going to change it. If you believe that uh, Trump is sent from God, then nothing's going to, that I'm going to say is going to change your mind. If you believe he's sent from Satan, nothing I can say is going to change your mind. And that's fine, but what I want to do with you is share what the scripture says. So we're not going to take uh, man's opinions. We're going to give what the scripture says. And as it breaks down, we'll learn more as we go. And I'll probably say that again shortly. But what it means is there's four, over 4,500,000 4, opinions of what this means. I have read and seen so many over the last week that it's mind-boggling. Uh, did you know that the, um, that the uh, horsemen held their swords a certain way and that the bow was drawn at full length? And I'm like, where are you getting this stuff? Where do you get this? It's amazing. Um, it's almost like reading a book and watching the movie. It's going to be completely different. My daughter for high school, uh, one of her graduating English classes is she had to read the original Mary Shelley Frankenstein. And so we have watched about everything that you can see on Frankenstein online, whether that be videos or movies. And in doing so, I hear this coming from the other side of the couch. That's not in the book. That's not the way that was originally written. That's not the way that was written. That is not in the book. That is not in there. And I'm thinking to myself with a chuckle, that's kind of what we hear about the Word of God. Uh, people say so many things uh, I'm chasing a rabbit, but have you ever heard anybody say, oh, a baby passed away. God needed another angel. Angels don't have souls. Human beings have souls. Babies have souls. But because people have said things like that for so long, we just take that and we apply it. But it's not actually in Scripture. So what we want to do is take this and break it down in Scripture. We're not going to take those 4,520,000 opinions. So we'll go into details. Not a lot of detail because we don't have a lot of detail. So where are we at? Good question. Let's overview what we've read so far. There'll be a slide on the screen here. Uh, white horse. This is what we know. That's the first seal. The white horse is the first seal. And a crown was given. We know that he, a crown was given to the rider of the white horse. We know that he has a bow. We know that he went out conquering and to conquer. He went out conquering and to conquer. Now from the testimonies I heard earlier and from my own personal testimony that doesn't relate to Christ to me, that relates to someone who would say they are a Christ or a Messiah and that would literally do other. Also, if you look at it in a sense of who opened the seals was Christ, the Lamb of God, 
and then these horses are being sent forth from that. So what do we know about the white horse? Crown was given, he has a bow, he went out conquering and to conquer. Red horse, second seal. This should be on your screen. It was a fiery red, a fire red, if you will, which is a little different than what we would look at as red, but it was a fiery red horse. That doesn't mean he was on fire, it just means fiery red. Uh, power given to him to take peace from the earth. Uh, I hope to preach right there in just a little bit, a minute or two about that, uh, because I believe that there is a key right there that we need to see. Uh, and that they should kill one another, and he was given a great sword. Uh, sword represents scripture many, many times in the Bible. Uh, in the end of Revelation, towards the end, uh, Jesus has a sword come from his mouth. Uh, the Bible is related to as a sword. Uh, words are a sword. Uh, and he was given a great sword, so we know that words can be a sword. Um, we'll stay, we'll skip that for now. Uh, third seal is a black horse. A black horse is the third seal. Let me go back over the second seal real quick. The red horse is a fiery red, power given to take peace from the earth, and that should kill, that they should kill one another, and he was given a great sword. The black horse, number three, the black horse. He had a pair of balances, that justice, equaling things out. And a voice said, this is the first time we hear, other than come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. A voice said, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see not to hurt the oil and wine. So what do we know about the black horse? He has a pair of balances. In other words, he can weigh things out. And a voice says, a voice of one of the angels or the beast speaks and says, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. And see not to hurt the oil and wine. The pale horse. Described as a light green or a pale color. This is the fourth seal. The pale horse or the fourth seal. He was named death. This is the first one that they've given a name to. He was named death. Um, we'll go back to that in a minute. And Hades followed with him. Hades is the word hell in the King James uh, is translated hell in Revelation. Uh, Hades, I think, is the original word there. Uh, but it came with him, death and Hades followed him. So who's coming with death? Not heaven, but hell. Uh, if for Jim Nelson out there today, I would say uh, that was probably Kurt Russell that said that right there. Probably one of the, just, it's a joke. Relax, it's a joke. Um, reference to the Tombstone movie who Jim can quote. Uh, power was given to him to kill one fourth part of the earth. One fourth part of the earth. I've always seen that as the people of the earth, but it says to kill one fourth part of the earth. We won't break all that down tonight, but it's interesting. To kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. The pale horse, he was named death. Hell came with him. Power was given unto him to kill one fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. All right, all right, so you got that, right? This is what we actually know from Revelation about the four horses of the apocalypse. Imagine that we have 4,520,000 opinions that we know of online about this from what we know. Let me give you some other scripture, slide two. Uh, some other scripture that could relate to the horses. Again, we're really doing an overview tonight, uh, and then we will break down more as we go. Uh, but I want to start moving a little more quickly uh, as, as we go. Uh, Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. This will be your second slide. Uh, Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. Uh, and I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots, out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. And the first chariot was red horses, and the second chariot black horses, and the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot gristled and bay horses. Um, those are, are spotted, if you will. 
then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, these are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Would definitely relate to Revelation 6, right? Of the black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. This is in the prophet Zechariah's writings. Uh, we can't 100% guarantee that this relates, but it certainly sounds very relatable. Again, this is written some hundreds of years before, so the wording is obviously the Old Testament is translated into Hebrew and the New Testament into Greek. So there is uh, some possibilities of a little bit of translation there. But if we relate the four spirits or the four horses as he saw them that are moving forth. The next slide, the third slide, uh, possibly uh, other scripture, but I'll give you one more set of scripture. Ezekiel 14, Ezekiel 14, 21 through 23. If you dig deep into these, you can apply these scripture and line this up. Uh, Ezekiel uh, 14, 21 through 23. For thus said the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome, be noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth both sons and daughters, behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. Now he's literally saying right here that, you know what? The only reason I would pour out my spirit or allow the Antichrist to pour out on the earth is because the earth is wretched, if you will. Uh, the earth is not following God. Uh, and I, I say the earth as in the people of the earth. And so we certainly want to understand and relate uh, this scripture. Why is God allowing these things to happen? He says there'll be a remnant left. I believe this is after the rapture of the church. John's caught up into heaven. These things begin to be poured out, but there will be a remnant of men and women that make it through the tribulation period. There'll be those that die for the cause of Christ during the tribulation period. Now you might say to me, why would you say that? How would you say that that happens? Well, I'll give you a real quick scenario. There are many people right now that say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but don't have an intimate walk with Christ. Now, while they may believe him, they have never accepted him as Savior because when you accept him as Savior, it says that his disciples follow his commandments. And so they live like heathen and then they believe that God's gonna accept it. I believe with everything in me when the rapture takes place that immediately those that thought they had a relationship or had a loose connection of knowing who God was, um, I believe with everything in me, they're gonna immediately turn to Christ. They're going to know that they know that they know that they missed it. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful scenario, that's my opinion. So you can add that to the list of opinions, but I believe that that will happen almost immediately when the moment the rapture takes place. Again, I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Uh, I've, I've studied the, the, uh, the scripture for so long and, and, and not that I'm an expert, but because I don't believe anybody could ever be a full expert, but I would say this to you. Uh, one of my main reasons for believing are the Feast of Israel. 
And the Feast of Israel, there's four summer feasts, there's three fall feasts, or four spring feasts and three fall feasts. Uh, the first feast, of course, is Passover, which we know represents our salvation, then unleavened bread, which represents our sanctification. Then we have Pentecost, which represents our spirit baptism. And then we have uh, first fruits, which represents Christ's resurrection and returning to heaven so that we can now be accepted there. Those that have passed on can be received into heaven. And then the, the fifth feast, and God has never broken these feasts, is a feast of trumpets. And trumpets represents the tribula or the trumpets represents the rapture, and then feast of atonement. And atonement represents, uh, which is always represented, and we'll see this later on in Revelation, uh, where when certain trumpets are blown uh, and things that that they would not have understood, and people that don't understand the Jewish tradition and how this is written may miss those things because a silver trumpet used at a certain time, a gold trumpet at a certain time. And so with that being said, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Trumpets must come. It's the beginning of the fall feast at the end of the harvest when everything is reaped. Uh, the Feast of the Trumpets and then Atonement would come, which is the seven years of tribulation. Then Tabernacles, which is the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. Uh, so I won't get into that any deeper than that tonight. In fact, I didn't know that I was going to go that deep. But we get back to this. That's why I believe it that way, or at least one of the main reasons is having broke that down for most of my adult Christian life. Uh, John saw these things, and there's so much symbolism in what he could see. Uh, we don't want to read more into it than is there, though. We don't want to read more into it than is there. So I'll give you the scripture that I believe is the heaviest that relate to it. So your last slide for tonight, I want to break these things down real quick. I want to break them down. I know we're... Uh, I'm 22 minutes in already, and uh, plus all the uh, the worship and the others. So, uh, but real quick, I want to break these down for you. So, give me another 20 minutes. Ha ha. Uh, there are four horsemen, each distinctive. Four horses, four horsemen. This is our last slide that you'll see tonight. Other than announcements, you may see announcements after we're done, uh, because tomorrow night I'll be in Springfield. Would love for you to tune in for that. Uh, there are four horsemen, each distinctive. The white horseman is a conqueror with a bow. He is a conqueror with a bow. Uh, he looks like a Christ. People will believe he is the Christ. In fact, there are many people that believe that today, that this is Christ coming back as a conqueror. Um, I believe when he comes back as a conqueror will be after the tribulation. That's my belief. Um, he looks like a Christ, but I do not believe he is. The red horseman is fiery, he's red, he's fiery. And it is clear, and notice this, and I've gotta hurry, I know, but notice this. I don't know why I keep looking at those lights like there's people in here, maybe I keep believing, but there's two bright lights right here shining straight in my eyes. Um, I believe with everything in me that we catch some nuggets in here for this. And authority was given unto him. He did not have the authority. Christ already has the authority. So when you see these horsemen getting authority given to them, how would it be that Christ needed authority given to him when he was the only one that could open the scrolls, when he was the only one that has authority to open and loose the scrolls into the tribulation? That is an awkward situation. So this fiery horseman, the red fiery horseman, he was given authority. Scripture says he was given authority. The white horseman was given his crown of authority. The red horseman was given his authority to take peace from the earth and to stir murder and discord. Let me make this clear. Help me, Holy Ghost. When there is no peace, there is war. He doesn't need to start war. All he needs to do is remove peace from the earth. All he needs to do is remove peace from the earth. One of the things that, that vexes my spirit, it, it breaks my heart, is to watch men and women of God, hear me out there today, sit and argue, constantly argue over things that don't make a bit of difference in the world. 
What color was the Long Ranger's white horse? It doesn't make a bit of difference that his white horse was white. The simple truth is this. All the enemy had to do on this red horse was to remove peace. How many people today are living in constant turmoil? Christ said, my peace I leave with you. I'm going, but I'm leaving my peace. And here we see that the fiery red horse is taking away peace. Now we think of that in the wars and rumors of wars, and believe me, they're out there in every detail. But at the end of the day, if God's people don't have peace, then they'll be at war. And for some today, you really need to set your spirit on Christ. Focus on things above and not on things of this world because the truth is, I know we need truth, but arguing over what color or shade of horse the red horse is or someone believes it a little differently than you, pray for them, love them, keep peace in your life and trust the Holy Spirit to do the work that he was sent here to do, which is draw all men unto Christ. It is a ploy of the enemy. Gosh, I don't want to preach here, but I'm going to preach here. It is a ploy of the enemy to sow discord. It is a ploy of the enemy to sow discord. So let me make this a little bit lighthearted. You've heard the joke of the man stranded on the desert island when they found him. He had three huts built. And they said, three huts? What's going on? He said, I live in that hut. They said, what's that? He said, that's the church I attend. He said, what's that? He said, that's the church I had to leave. He's the only one on the island. So many times we're caught up in, my daughter thought that was funny, right? We get so caught up in fussing and fighting and arguing a point that at the end of the day it won't save anyone's soul. It won't draw me any closer to Christ. I say this with utmost love. The scripture says that the red horse was going to take peace. I don't believe that's just wars and rumors of wars. I believe that's in the heart of every man and the heart of every woman and the heart of every child. There's a reason suicide is so high. There's a reason that there is constant war and bickering among men and women of God because the enemy already has begun taking peace. Let me move on. He wants to stir murder and discord. When peace is gone, that's what happens. The black horse, the horseman had scales. We know this from scripture. The black horse, the horseman had scales. Then it goes into food distribution, uh, famine, and a time of scarcity. Again, we're already seeing the birthing pains of this on planet Earth. Uh, it's been around for 2,000 years, different areas at different times. If we just look at America, then we go, oh, this is just happening, but this has been happening. Uh, in fact, in the book of Acts, it was written like this. Uh, Peter stands up and says, this was what was written by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. He said, it's already started 2,000 years ago when Christ left the earth. So we know that these are the last of the last days. We understand that. So we're not trying to be sens sensationalism or sensationalist here. But what we do want you to understand is that in the last of the last days, there's going to be an outpouring of God's spirit, but also the enemy the birthing pains of the tribulation will get harder and rougher and worse and worse. But it has been going on forever, at least for the last 2,000 years. But moving on, uh, he tells them don't harm the wine and the oil. Those are always related in scripture to the finer things. So he says take and, and starvation and stuff, but there'll always be a remnant somewhere that, that has things that uh, hopefully that's God's people and not the world, but there they are. And if it's the world and not God's people, then we will say that they are uh, going to give into our bosom, right? Pressed down, shaken together, and uh, men will give into our bosom. We'll believe that. Amen. Uh, the pale horse whose rider was named Death, and hell or Hades came with him. Again, I, Jesus came to save men, not to send them to hell. I can't imagine Jesus bringing hell to earth with him to straighten people out. That just doesn't make sense in my brain. And power was given to them. They did not have the authority. It was given to them. Jesus took the authority of death, hell, and the grave when he died on Calvary and rose again. Uh, we just celebrated Easter. 
Please hear me when I say this. The authority had to be given to them. I'm not making something up. It's right there in your text three times. A crown was given, authority was given, authority was given. Um, we'll go farther. They can take that slide down. Uh, we'll go farther than this. Uh, we'll not go farther than this tonight. It's plain and simple, but let me recap. These horses and horsemen of the apocalypse uh, will be at the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. I believe that with everything in me. God's people in the last days, uh, the beginning of the birth pains will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Understand me when I say this. Yes, things are getting ugly. God's spirit will be poured out on us. Before the tribulation comes, things will get ugly. The beginning of birth pains. Uh, how many knows that uh, a woman doesn't go, oh, having a baby, and it happens instantly. Most of the time, there is a season of contractions. They start at 10 minutes apart, 12 minutes apart, 20 minutes apart, and right before the baby comes, they increase in pain, severity, and in uh, speed. But we also know that in the last days, God's people will be endued with power. The closer we draw to him, the more power we live in, the more authority we live in. So instead of stressing over what could be coming soon, uh, which we should have been prepared for our whole lives, we don't know that that's happening right now, but we want to understand that God's people are empowered and that we are moving through, excuse me, God's people in the last days will be empowered. Then the Antichrist, who probably is on the earth right now, if we're at the end of the last days, don't think he's in power at this time, or at least not in the power that he will have, but he's in power. Uh, things will become more clear as we study this and break it down. But as of right now, this is what we know. We're looking at scripture from a 2,000 year old perspective with a modern day application. 2,000 year old perspective, not from an American standpoint. Everybody relates everything in scripture to America. Remember, it relates to the Middle East and us. So it, it, it relates to them and us. So what you see happening in America doesn't necessarily always relate to when you see it happening in Israel and Egypt and those areas, then we know that it's heightening, if you will. Pale horse death, who took authority over death? Jesus. Who took authority over death? Jesus. And hell came with him. Who took the keys to hell? Jesus, right? So it stands to reason the one who is opening the scrolls, Jesus, would not be the one that would be uh, out doing the damage. However, they can't do the damage without the authority being given to them, which is an outpouring of God's wrath, but not what we will see in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, as opposed to the first three and a half years. Remember this. Let me close with this. God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. The tribulation is going to be nasty. The birth pains are not going to be easy. We're going to go through some of those birth pains. One world government will need to be in place. We understand that. We know that things have to happen to line those things up. Uh, there'll be murder, no peace. So many things that have been going on for a while and are getting worse. Uh, as contractions get closer, times will get harder. But remember this. And this is the key to it all tonight. We'll start back with verse 9 next week. But this is the key to it all tonight. The four horses of the apocalypse mean this. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you don't need a relationship that relates to, uh, oh, well, I've heard about the stories and I'm, uh, he knows me the way I am and he understands me. Life's good. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an intimate walk with Christ. An intimate walk with Christ. You need to know that you know that you know no matter what happens, when the rapture takes place, when the horses are poured out, none of that applies if you know Christ in an intimate way. And when you know him in an intimate way, my friends, if your relationship with him is not top notch, find a way to get it there. Draw closer to him. As we see many things being fulfilled in scripture, draw closer to him. Don't stress about when it's coming or what. Stress about knowing Christ and knowing him in an intimate way. We've heard testimonies tonight on that already. Know Christ. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, kneel down by your couch right now and say, Father, I, I am a sinner. Forgive me. I don't understand it. I don't know it, but I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to live forever with you. 
forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, and send me someone to help me grow along the way. If you prayed that prayer, send us a message. Let us know so we can get some materials out to you uh, and get some things to you uh, that we can help you along the way with your growth. We can set you up with a church no matter where you're at in the world. We should be able to find you a good Bible-believing church. We love you tonight. We're not studying this to scare you. We're studying this to inform you because Scripture says, blessed is the man who reads this prophecy. Hey, God bless you. We love you. Remember, check out the announcements. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, I will be at Springfield Church of God. Uh, we will be, uh, not Springfield, New Beginnings Church of God in Springfield uh, doing an interview. Type in a question if you have it, and we'll try to answer those questions for you. God bless you. Have a great night.